Welcome back to Battleship Systems. Today, we're in engine room number two of the Battleship New Jersey. We're sitting in front of the benchboard for switchboard number two. This is the benchboard that controls the AC generating plant for engine room number two, specifically generators number three and four. The benchboard is laid out in three units. Let's take a look at the middle unit. There's one half of it for generator number three and one half for generator number four. Up here we have the amp meters and volt meters for the DC exciter, the amp meter and volt meter for the generator itself. We have a watt meter for the generator and a power factor meter. We also have a temperature indicating meter for the winding itself. Now, on the other side, we have identical controls for generator number four. And up over here, we have the switch that turns on power to the field coils. Now, this center section is synchronizing equipment. If you remember back to basics of electricity part eight, in order to parallel AC generators, you have to make sure, number one, the voltages are the same and you would do that by adjusting these exciter rheostats for the generator. You also have to make sure that the frequencies are the same. So you have a frequency meter here that you can switch to go to the generator, number three, number four, or the bus. Lastly, you have to make sure that the voltage peaks happen at exactly the same time as the oncoming generator. And to do that, you use this synchroscope or the synchronizing lamps. So if you wanted to bring generator number three and parallel it with generator number four, you would first bring up generator number three, then set your synchroscope to generator number four. Then when the synchroscope is spinning in a slow clockwise direction, just before it hits the zero marker, you close the breaker. At this point, you would use the governor controls to balance the load. Obviously, when loads increase on a generator, the voltage is going to drop. So if you have more devices connected to a generator, you're going to want to increase the exciter current to increase the voltage. Then as devices turn off, you have to shut it down and cut in more resistance. Obviously, you don't want to be sitting here all day just changing the exciter field. So that's why we can assign it to our friend, the voltage regulator. The automatic voltage regulator will control the field excitation and regulate the voltage at a constant level. And you could adjust the voltage that it's regulating at with this voltage adjusting rheostat. Some controls down here we have, well, some important one is the the governor control switch. This allows us to increase or decrease the speed of the turbo generators. And then down here we have the actual circuit breakers or the controls for the circuit breakers to close the generators to our switchboard. Now look at this section. This section is the bus type part of the switchboard. We have one section over here that goes to switchboard number four one side over here goes to switchboard number one. Now, since we're switchboard number two, we can connect our switchboard to four or one. But to do that, just like paralleling a generator, when we parallel switchboards, we also have to make sure the voltage is the same, the frequency is the same, and the peaks are rising and falling at the same time. So over here, we have a voltmeter for the bus tie. We can switch that voltmeter to show the volts on switchboard number one or number four. Over here we have the frequency meter. And finally we have our synchroscope switch. We can control the speed of our generators from these governor controls. Then when the synchroscope is spinning slowly in a clockwise direction, just before it reaches the zero, we close the bus time. Now, these are the controls for the bus ties. So this one here is circuit breaker to switchboard number one. So in other words, you're connecting switchboard two to one. This is the switch 
to connect the switchboard to number four. But you'll notice it has a plate on it that says, do not close this bus tie circuit breaker without official orders. And there's even a lock you have to turn to even close that lever. Now, why is that? So first off, there are some reasons that you would want to connect all the switchboards together. Um, right now, for one, because we have shore power going into switchboard number three, if you want all the switchboards to have power, you better close the bus ties. But when we are running our turbo generators, if we close the bus tie to switchboard number four, switchboard number four is likely tied with switchboard number three. So now we've also tied in with switchboard number one. So that's one, two, three, and four. That means all eight generators of the battleship are connected together. Now that gives us 10,000 kilowatts of power. So what is the problem with that? With a 10,000 kilowatts power, nothing is really gonna happen if we close that bus tie. Motors will have plenty of watts. Transformers will run fine. Nobody will notice anything. The problem is, what happens when there's a short on the line? If you remember, this switchboard operates at 450 volts. Well, in a battleship, a lot of things run on 450 volts. And you probably can't walk 10 feet without reaching something that operates on 440 volts, whether that be a ventilation motor, a transformer, a turret, or a mount. That means that every generator on the ship is connected to every 440 volt circuit. Now, what happens if there's a fault in one of these circuits? Now, I'm not talking about a ground fault. So over here are the ground detector lamps. On the episode we did about ground faults, I built a ground detector lamp based on that wiring diagram. And we noticed that when you ground one of the wires, all of the other lights get bright and the phase that has the ground gets dim. And if you watch that episode, you and I both know that a ground fault in an ungrounded system is nothing. It doesn't even spark. But what happens if two of those wires get grounded? Or what happens if somebody throws a wrench inside an electrical panel or something shorts out in a motor, what you have is a bolted line-to-line -line short circuit. So what does this mean? You gotta put yourself in the perspective of an electron. If I'm coming out of that generator and I'm deciding where to go, do you think I'm gonna go to your high impedance load, your motors, your transformers? Or am I gonna go where everybody else is going to that fault? Remember, I'm an electron, I'm Mr. Negativity. My sole purpose in life is to get where there's a lack of electrons. Obviously, I'm going to go to that short. Now we're talking a bit of a traffic jam here. With all those electrons converging at a single point, you generate a lot of heat and that heat eventually melts whatever it is that is creating that short. Think of it as the bridge has burned down. But we're electrons. We don't care that our bridge is burned down. We need to get to where we're needed and we'll just fly through the air. And so an arc is formed. The arc acts as a wire which conducts the fault current. So how many amps are actually running through that fault. Well, obviously, how many amps depends on what kind of generators you have. So let's say we have one generator on the line. How many amps is our fault current? So if you go over to the generator and look at the nameplate, it's gonna say 2,005 amps. That's the generator's full load working amps, the amount of amps that it can create without breaking a sweat but the short kind of changes the game here. So if you put yourself back in the perspective of an electron, everybody is now going to that short. If everybody is going to the short, the amount of electrons, the end that is positive, 
will equal the amount of electrons that's on the end that would normally be negative. This means that you have two phases that no longer have voltage. If you remember back from Basics of Electricity 8, an AC generator has a rotor that generates a magnetic field and that spins. And around it you have a stator that picks up that magnetic field. Since the ship service system is running through that stator and it has a voltage, the stator will also generate a magnetic field that opposes the rotor's field. But when you have a fault, there's no voltage in the stator. No voltage means no magnetic field. And so now the rotor's field will cut through the stator like it never has before. When that stator field collapses, we enter what is known as the subtransient phase of the fault. Since the stator is no longer producing a magnetic field, the rotor's magnetic field runs unopposed. This creates a surge of current. It's usually six to 18 times the generator's rated load. Now, as somebody who has failed calculus, I'm not gonna go through the math to figure out what the actual short circuit current is, but I've been told for one of these generators, it's about 22,000 amps. Now, luckily we have circuit breakers. These devices will sense the inrush in current and trip. They will open up their contacts, which the electrons won't like. Again, they'll create an arc, but they'll open wide enough and they're designed to extinguish the arc to stop the flow of current. But even if they didn't, the subtransient stage only lasts for a short period. Eventually we enter what is known as the steady state phase. The current at this point is about three to eight times its rated load. And don't forget about our friend, the automatic voltage regulator. When it sees that massive drop of current, it's gonna automatically cut out all the resistance to that field coils. And it's gonna make this generator produce 7,750 amps. That's with one generator on the line. What if we had four generators on the line? That's gonna make our short circuit current 40 to 60,000 amps. These circuit breakers are also designed to break that kind of current. But what if somebody went over there and closed the circuit breaker tying number two to number four? That means we will have eight generators on the line. The short circuit current for eight generators is between 80 to 130,000 amps. With that kind of amperage, you don't get a spark or an arc. You get an explosion. The plasma burst will vaporize anything in the vicinity and blow the cover off of any electrical devices, endangering people in the vicinity, possibly even rupturing bulkheads, definitely starting fires. Suddenly the ship gets very dark because there's no more voltage for any of the devices. All the generators are now shifting their energy into that fault. The circuit breakers will trip, they'll try to break the flow of current, and they will fail. At that amperage, the contacts don't open wide enough to break the flow of current. So now you have a situation where you have so many amps flowing through the wires that they will start to melt. But it's not the end of the world. The manufacturer, Westinghouse, specifically states that this is designed to withstand a short circuit event. And even if the wires do melt, you have these manual bus transfer switches to where critical systems can get their power from different circuits. Here also, there's a possibility that the circuit breaker for the generator will be able to trip and stop the flow of current in this event. But all this because somebody flipped a switch on that switchboard. What do you think is the most dangerous switch on a battleship? Let us know in the comments section below, and don't forget to like and subscribe. The ship service system is a battleship system. There are four switchboards, and each switchboard carries current for that section of the ship.
we're in switchboard number two, which is kind of forward in the ship. And one of the big consumers in the forward action of the ship is turrets one and two. We've got two big breakers down there to supply power to that. So a lot of times we're gonna be sharing the load with another switchboard. Now, when we open up to general quarters, the idea is that if there's a problem with one of the switchboards in the middle of the ship, you don't want it to affect something in the front of the ship. So you would start your generators, close all the bus ties, so each switchboard is running on their own generators. There are also sometimes reasons where you might want to connect switchboards two to four together. For example, if you only had one generator in here running and switchboard number one is down for maintenance, then again, you would only have three or four generators on the line. Last but not least, I'd like to give a big thank you and shout out to the crew of the Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial for letting me come down here and play with all their electrical equipment. If you're feeling charitable, there's a link in the description that'll bring you to the Homeport Alliance for the USS New Jersey website where you can donate to the nonprofit organization. Thanks for watching.